Today we continue with uh, part 10 of our series on the church and the different names uh, attributed to the church. So today we will read a few verses from Isaiah 56, Jeremiah 31, and from the New Testament in Ephesians chapter 4. So from Isaiah 56, beginning with verse 6, this is the word of the Lord. And the foreigners who joined themselves to the Lord to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord, and to be his servants, everyone who keeps the Sabbath and does not profane it and holds fast to my covenant, this I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples. The Lord God who gathers the outcasts of Israel declares, I will gather yet others to him besides those already gathered. From Jeremiah 31, beginning with verse 31. The word of the Lord. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. And from Ephesians 4, beginning with verse 11, the word of the Lord. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature and of the fullness of Christ, so that we may be no longer be children, tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Thus far the reading of God's holy and inerrant word. Let us pray. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Dear Congregation of Christ, nearing the end of this series on the church, let us again review the nine lessons we have studied so far. So if we refer to the church as a metaphorical place or structure, we may think of the Garden of Eden, the Ark of Noah uh, that Noah built, and the temple at Mount Zion and the Lord's vineyard. But if we think of the church as a people, we recall Adam and Eve, Noah and his family, foreigners and strangers like Abraham and his household, the Israelites, as redeemed people from slavery in Egypt, 
and as wilderness pilgrims, God's holy nation in the promised land, and the flock of the good shepherd. So those are the things we have learned uh, from uh, the first few uh, nine lessons uh, in this series. Today we will meditate on one of the most familiar metaphors for the church, the body of Christ. But before we embark on this study, let me tell a Reformation event that probably most of you never heard of. And this will also boost and strengthen our confidence in the Reformed doctrine of the Lord's Supper, which we will administer today. Way back in 1553, 15-year-old King Edward VI of England died with no heir to the throne. The most powerful man after him was his chief minister, John Dudley, a Protestant, who would then ascend the throne. There was no heir. The next in line was Catholic Mary Tudor, the daughter of Queen Catherine of Aragon, Henry VIII's first wife. But the Protestant, John Dudley, wanted to preserve England for the Protestants, for the reformers. And so he arranged for his daughter-in-law, Lady Jane Grey, to become queen. If only for her intellect and classical education, she was fluent in Latin, Greek, Hebrew, and Italian, she was most qualified to be queen. And so on July 10, 1553, Lady Jane was crowned king, but she became known as the Nine Days Queen. Why? The Privy Council and the majority of the people supported Mary Tudor because he, she was the rightful heir to the throne. Therefore, just nine days after Queen uh, Jane, Lady Jane, was crowned, the Privy Council proclaimed Mary Tudor queen and imprisoned Lady Jane Grey. Mary Jane, uh, Mary then persecuted Protestants, executing 275 of them, and so she became popularly known or unpopularly known as Bloody Mary. Before Lady Jane was beheaded, Mary sent her um, trusted Catholic advisor, John of Feckenham, to the Tower of London to persuade her to recant her Protestant faith and her rejection of the Catholic doctrine of the Lord's Supper. The Catholic Church taught, and still teaches, that the bread and wine are mystically transformed, transformed into the body and blood of Christ. But the reformers taught two main doctrines on this sacrament, two different doctrines. One is the memorial view, which is held by, still held by most evangelicals today, that the Lord's Supper is merely a remembrance of the broken body and shed blood of Christ. The other reform view is the real presence view that Christ is really present in the Lord's Supper, but not physically, but spiritually by faith alone. And that the bread and wine actually nourishes us spiritually, again, by faith. So, um, I will read a part of the conversation of the exchange between 17-year-old Lady Jane Grey and John Feckenham in the Tower of London. So, uh, Feckenham, why do you receive, uh, what do you receive in the sacrament? Do you not receive the bo very body and blood of Christ? Lady Jane, no, surely I do not so believe. I think that at the supper I neither receive flesh nor blood, but, but bread and wine. Feckenham, why did not Christ speak this? Uh, why did not Christ speak these words? Take, eat, this is my body. Lady Jane, I grant he said so. 
And so he said, I am the vine, I am the door, but he is never the more, never the more the door nor the vine. Peckenham, why? Is it not possible that Christ by his power could make his body both to be eaten and broken and to be born of a woman without men as to walk upon the sea? Lady Jane, yes, truly. But where was Christ when he said, take it, this is my body? Was he not in the table when he said so? He was at that time alive and suffered not till the next day. What he did take but bread. What did he break but bread? Look, what he took he broke. And look, what he broke he gave. And look, what he gave they did it. And yet all this time he himself was alive. And at supper before his disciples or else they were deceived. So that was part of this exchange. Does this conversation remind you of another conversation? Though not as astonishing as a 12-year-old Jesus discussing things of God with the Jewish teachers of the law, the 17-year-old Lady Jane had more biblical knowledge and wisdom than the Catholic advisor to the queen. When we partake of the Lord's Supper, we remember Paul's words. Because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. We know that there is no direct connection between the body of Christ in the Lord's Supper and the body of Christ as the church. Only that we are united by faith in the one bread from heaven. However, the church is the body of Christ. We read that all throughout the New Testament. And that this one body is united in one spirit, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and one God. From the beginning, this body is also united into one holy covenanted nation gathered by God. And therefore, our theme today is the church, part 10, the body gathered as one covenant nation. So we have two headings. So first, the body gathered as one nation in an earthly promised land. The whole Bible is a progressive revelation of God's plan of salvation to all those whom he had chosen before the creation of the world. How did God reveal this plan? It was through his covenants with men, with Adam, with Abraham, with, uh, with Noah, with Abraham, with Moses, and with David, and finally with Christ. In the beginning, at paradise, God gathered Adam and Eve before him and covenanted with them. On that day, on the day that they ate of the fruit of the forbidden tree, they will die. The converse is implied. If they pass this covenant test, they would attain eternal life. But they failed their probation and invoked God's eternal wrath on them and all humankind, all their descendants. And so God revealed to them right there in his holy garden, his eternal plan to save some of their descendants whom he had chosen as his covenant people. A son of the woman would crush Satan's head by being himself wounded by that ancient serpent. So from Genesis chapter 3, we turn to chapters uh, 6 to 9, where we learn that man descended into such wickedness that God decided to wipe out the whole human race by a great flood. But there was a man, Noah, 
who was righteous and blameless before God. And so God revealed his coming wrath to him and his plan to save his family of eight through an ark that would withstand the coming deluge. After the flood, God covenanted with Noah with the same commandment to Adam to fill and tend the earth and promising never again to destroy the earth by water. Turning to chapters uh, 12 to 17, we read about God's calling a man named Abram to leave his home in a place called Ur of the Chaldees and go to a place unknown to him. So by faith, Abram obeyed God, bringing his whole household to Canaan, where he lived in tents with his sons Isaac and grandson Jacob and their households. God then covenanted with Abraham, promising him a multitude of descendants and their inheritance of the same land where he sojourned. And then in Genesis 37 through 50, we read, uh, we read about Jacob's family migrating to Egypt because there was a severe famine in Canaan. His son Joseph then became, because of his godly wisdom, rose to become the Pharaoh's vice regent. Fast forward to the book of Exodus, when 400 years later the Israelites were and they became slaves in Egypt. So God then called Moses to gather his people, the Israelites, from slavery to Egypt, in Egypt, to Mount Sinai. So before the mountain, God, God gathered the 12 tribes of Israel and covenanted with them, declaring them to be his treasured possession, a kingdom of priests, and a holy nation. After 40 years of wilderness wanderings, they finally entered, conquered, and settled in the promised land as God promised their forefather Abraham. So however, for over eight centuries, from the days of the judges to the kings and to the prophets, Israel repeatedly fell into grievous sins and faithlessness. In the end, God's patience with his chosen nation ran out, and so he sent the Babylonians to destroy the land and its temple. The conquerors then brought the most important and prominent citizens to Babylon as slaves. For 40 years before this destruction, the prophet Jeremiah warned, uh, warned Israel to repent of their covenant law-breaking and turn back to God, but all in vain. But all is not bad, for he also had good news. So in chapters 30 to 33 of Jeremiah, God revealed to him that he would make a new covenant with his broken people and bring them back to the promised land. God's promise of restoration of his people under a new covenant a covenant unlike the old covenant that Israel broke. So in this covenant, God would write his, his law on his people's hearts and minds, and so they would remain faithful and obedient before him. Jeremiah and the Jews then understood this covenant promises only in their own context. Seventy years in exile, and after which God would restore them back to Canaan. And so we read in Jeremiah 32, verse 37, Behold, I will gather them from all the countries to which I have driven them in my anger and my wrath and in great indignation. I will bring them back to this place, and I will make them dwell in safety. So, and then under King Cyrus of Persia, they were finally allowed to return to their land. But this, this near fulfillment of the regathering of the Jews back to their earthly promised land is merely a foretaste 
of the far fulfillment of another regathering of God's people. So secondly, the body regathered as one nation in a heavenly promised land. So the, uh, the prophet Jeremiah wrote that before he was even conceived in his mother's womb, the Lord already appointed him to be a prophet to the nations, Jeremiah 1.5. And so if we turn to chapters 46 to 51, we read Jeremiah's prophecies of judgment against Egypt, Philistia, Moab, Ammon, and the whole earth, and Babylon. They would be judged because of their violence against God's people Israel. And therefore, from out of these nations, the Lord will gather his dispersed people once more. God's purpose from creation was to dwell with his people and be their God right there, right there in the garden. From the day that Adam sinned in the Garden of Eden, God set out to, to save and regather his people into one holy nation. So God gathered Noah and his family into the ark, Abraham and his household in Canaan, Moses and the Israelites at Mount Sinai and in the Promised Land, David and his kingdom, and finally, the body of Christ in her pilgrimage to heaven from earth. In all these regatherings, God made a covenant with the heads of the body of Christ. Adam, Noah, Abraham, Moses, David, and with Christ himself. Isaiah prophesied that foreigners would join themselves to the Lord. These aliens would serve him, love him, keep the Sabbath and the new covenant, and pray and worship with joy in the house of the Lord. He would gather them in his holy mountain, his temple, his church. Who are these foreigners? The Lord says in Isaiah 56, 8, I will gather yet others to him besides those already gathered. Who are the already gathered? Those are the Jews, the Old Testament people of God. The ones who are foreigners are Gentiles, peoples and nations who were formerly alienated outside, alienated from God's people, the Jews, whom God already gathered under the Old Covenant. Jeremiah prophesied that God would make a new covenant with his people. In this new covenant, God will, uh, would write his law on their hearts, unlike in the old covenant with Israel, when God wrote his law where? On tablets of stone, not on people's hearts. Since the law was not written on their hearts, the Jews continually broke the law. Ezekiel also prophesied that the Holy Spirit would indwell God's people. These two acts by God would enable the people to be faithful and obedient to him. So we read that in Ezekiel 36, verses 26 to 28. So the Lord also promised his new covenant people in his, uh, Ezekiel 36, 24, he said, I will take you from the nations and gather you from all the countries and bring you into your own land. How would God fulfill and accomplish all these promises to his people? He would send his son, Jesus Christ, the head and mediator of the new covenant, to cleanse them of their sins by his once for all sacrifice on the cross. And so from his first coming to his second coming, he is now regathering his body, the church, as one people made up of both Jews and Gentiles from all nations, tribes, 
and languages, those who would believe in him as Savior and Lord. And this is why the church is also called the body of Christ, Christ himself being the head. And therefore, the church is Christ's church, not anyone else's church, but Christ's own treasured possession. All true believers are members of this one body of Christ, all equally important to the overall health of the body. No member of his body can think or say that he is more useful or important than other members. So we read all of that in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, the whole chapter. In fact, God calls the church to give greater honor, greater honor, honor to those who are considered of less honor or value. And therefore, the church is called to be united in one spirit, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and one God, the Father of all. The outcome of this spiritual unity is joy, joy in Christ, whether in suffering or whether in good things. And so, beloved body of Christ, Paul calls us to have the same mind and at the same and the same love and to do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. We are to be humble in our relationships in the body of Christ, just as Christ humbled himself all the way to his death on the cross. So as we partake of the Holy Communion as the body of Christ, let us remember the symbolism of partaking one bread broken into smaller pieces. We are members of this one body of Christ. Because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all, all partake of the one bread.